Okay, hello everybody here. And um, hello also uh, all the thirds that are watching us uh, on the live streams and all the people at home that cannot come here. Um, we are four, four people who have done a fun project. And um, my name is Felix. Um, there's Tillman, Georg and Mark. And, um, we would like to show you the results of our fun project, which is um, taking over the storm botnet. Okay, so um, there are some critical things about the laws, you know. So we can't really show you here um, how to take over the whole botnet. We would uh, even get in trouble if taking over one single machine if it's not our own. So we can only demonstrate this with our own machine, but we can assure you this, was, this is really working in the real storm botnet. <laughs> Right, there are still um, too many people here, probably Leos as well. Any law enforcement officers here? <laughs> no. Okay, and um, we will also publish our source code, but we cannot publish the full source code, like to have a ready-made tool, but we can only uh, publish parts which are for research and stuff, you know, research. And, uh, <laughs> right. Um, Okay, um, and because we have done the work all together, we have also split the talk. And um, Georg is starting with a so short introduction, and then every one of us is giving um, some details about a specific part and how we all did it. All right? So have fun. Um, ah, great. So, hi everybody, I'll be starting with a very brief and uh, high-level introduction to the Stormworm botnet. Actually, Stormworm is the most known name, but there's a lot of different names for the Smelver family. So there's PCOM and, and I don't know how to pronounce the others in, in English, but there's a lot of names, as you can see on the slides. And this thread was actually first seen somewhere in summer 2006, so this is not so new. Um, back then, in 2007, the estimated size was 500,000 to 1 million infected computers, which is actually, in botnet terms, not so, so huge, so there's other big botnets that are still ISC-based, but this one was new, and actually, the 1 million host estimate was, yeah, it was very high, so people think it was lower, but this was the estimate back then, and right now, according to our estimations, the actual botnet size is below 100,000. That is, that is the botnet uh, bots that we saw, so maybe we don't see everything, but that's what we estimated. So it shrank. And that is because uh, back in 2007, Microsoft used their, well, authority to all Windows XP computers with the update me mechanism and the malicious software removal tool to remove 250,000 infections they counted. So. Um, this is why the botnet shrank a lot, and also this means there was at some point at least 250,000 for sure because Microsoft counted it like this. So what does it do? I mean, uh, there's again a technically interested person running this botnet. Um, some people in, at first thought it was Russians running the botnet. Nowadays people say, well, they're using servers in Russia, but it might be actually Americans because, uh, as we'll later see, it looks like they're real American uh, culture to people. So what does it do? Well, it sends spam for profit and also for spreading. It performs distributed denial of service attacks because um, either for blackmailing, but we didn't see that actually, but the, the, what we saw is if, you, if you're a researcher, and uh, they think uh, you're wanting to reverse engineer them because, for example, you download a binary very, very often from the same IP address, um, you will just get a DDoS on yourself. So they're actually trying to protect their, their network. And then what they're doing is, of course, harvest email addresses because themselves you're sending spam. So how do you actually get this uh, stuff on, on your whatever that is? Um, yeah. Infection vectors, samples spammed as mail attachments. This is not very sophisticated per se. So you have uh, Mr. Santa Claus. This was uh, 2007, um, before, just before Christmas. So uh, they say, oh, download the free scripture of this nice Santa Claus girl. Halloween uh, 2007, there was a dancing skeleton. So uh, if, you, if you click on this, uh, you will have a funny dancing skeleton on your desktop. Hey, do this. Uh, then someone. Uh, uh, this or last year, there was also invasion of Iran. 
So they send, oh, new news, USA invaded the Iran, and here's the video. Download this exit to show the video. So, but they are a little bit more sophisticated than just trusting on the average dumb user. Actually, they are linking to web pages that have drive-by exploits. So you click on the, on the link uh, in the email, and then you're redirected to a page that has some exploits for Internet Explorer and stuff like this. And only if they determine that you're not vulnerable to all these exploits, they send you a raw link to the simple binary. So this is how you get Storm. If you're, you probably, the guys here didn't click on the dancing skeleton, maybe you clicked on the stripping Santa. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's more for, for, the, for the average PC user that gets infected by this. Once you're infected, how does it work and what's new about it? Actually, Stormworm botnet is not a classical, traditional IRC-like botnet or whatever. It's a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. So this means you cannot just go to Russia or wherever, or China, and take down their command and control server and say, bam, your botnet is gone. This is what law enforcement is doing all the time with other botnets. But this one actually uses a peer-to-peer -peer network for communication. And you can hardly take down all 250,000 or more Stormworm nodes per hand and say, now the botnet is gone. Could. Yeah, Schreible could, of course. Um, but um, what it actually does is that it uses this peer-to-peer -peer network for finding the real command and control servers. So it's not really that a command and control that is only in the peer-to-peer -peer network where commands are forwarded or stuff like this. Uh, it just uses this peer-to-peer -peer network as a kind of replacement for DNS. So um, once a storm worm tries to find new commands, what it first does is um, it goes to the peer-to-peer -peer network, it bootstraps, we will see more about this later on, and uh, ask, where can I find a command and control server which, which gives me these commands? And then, as you can see here, it's somewhere, it, it routes a query through the network based on a specific hash, and then some node knows, oh, this command and control server is over here, and then it initiates a second command and control connection that is TCP-based, actually, to, to a uh, node that can tell him, these are the updates. So the actual commands are not sent via the peer-to-peer -peer network, but they are sent via a custom TCP protocol that contains certain command strings and how to behave. So it's, it's not fully peer-to-peer, -peer. it's not so super sophisticated. As we see, they actually reduced, uh, uh, reused a library that will be explained later on for, for the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So what they did, they took their existing stuff and just replaced DNS by this peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay. Um, this is old stuff, actually, Stormworm. I mean, as you see, it's two years old, and as it was new, many researchers got interested. So why did we care? I mean, this is boring stuff on the first sight. Well, actually, there was, except for Joe Stewart, who presented on this on Black Hat, that is what we know of, of course. There might be, have been more at various antivirus companies. There was no real deep reverse engineering on this because it's heavily obfuscated. It's C++, multi-threaded. Even if it wouldn't be obfuscated, it is a pain in the ass to debug this whole beast. So what people did is they, they just ran it in a, in a VMware and looked like what it behaves. So uh, this is the reason why, why a lot of the initial research was very fuzzy or just plain wrong or not very accurate because people just took a sandbox, ran it in there and did some dynamic analysis. And what we did, uh, or what mainly Felix did, is the manual reverse engineering of the malware. And then we developed a solution to then overtake the botnet from the findings. So our new findings, just as you see, what we did, or what Felix did, uh, Reverse engineered is first the, the generation algorithm for the CNC lookup hash because um, others just ran it in, in, a, in a sandbox each day for 32 times or even for 200 times to find out what to search for in the high, uh, in the peer to peer network. We just can give you the algorithm now. Then how are these uh, command and control hosts encoded in the search results because it's not just IP as a string and then uh, the port or something, it's actually encoded there somehow. We can tell you how it is encoded. And then, how does the command protocol work? People just ran it in a, a virtual machine and said, oh, this is, uh, this is probably an update because it contains an URL or something like this. The reverse, reverse engineering now shows you what commands are there actually. And then there's a challenge response. I mean, you could tell, okay, this is probably a challenge response, but you could not actually authenticate to a real command and control server because you didn't know how the challenge response algorithm worked. It's actually a boring sort, but you need to know that. How does the update command actually work and how to update? 
And then what we then did is we built a disinfector. So we don't want, uh, if, if we can overtake a storm node, we are white hats, of course, we also want to disinfect it from storm. So we wrote a simple disinfector that terminates the running instance of Stormworm, which is not so easy because it injects itself into services access, so you cannot just use terminate process for it. And then also removes the on-disk binaries of storm. Yeah. And actually, we have working implementation code that is going to be rated today uh, that, for example, hatch generation C. And this is our, is only our only pieces of the puzzle that are going to be released today. And later, maybe we will even release something more. Let's see. Or someone else will put it together. We don't know. And um, that's what we did. So what was very funny during this research was actually tracking the trackers. Because if you look into the peer-to-peer -peer network, you see some peers are highly active and they, they do some eye-catching stuff. Because if you look at the hashes here, they are largely the same and they only differ in the first byte. So why does somebody do this? They flood the network with search requests. The reason is that they wanted to enumerate all peers in the peer-to-peer -peer network to, uh, to see uh, which computers are infected. But the way they did it, instead of passively listening, but actively pushing a lot of requests was very, very noisy. So uh, here are a couple of universities that actually made their hosts very visible. There is the University of San Diego. There is uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology, the University of Michigan, and then the University of Mannheim, which just very easily revealed which hosts are crawling. So, I mean, if I would run the storm botnet, I would just have DDoS these computers. And then also the Institute Iricom was, as I know, uh, used the connection of the University of Mannheim to do the same research. So they crawled this peer-to-peer -peer network. And, um, yeah, I would have done it more passively, maybe. But, yeah, that's up to them, actually. So these are some interesting host names, just by the way. So uh, how does this whole peer-to-peer -peer stuff work? And let's get some peer-to-peer -peer theory about this from Mark. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you, Georg. Um, we will now go a little bit deeper into the peer-to-peer -peer details of uh, Stormworm, of the communication. I think from some of you who perhaps spent some time or read something about the Stormworm, some papers or the diploma thesis, um, that was done on, the, on this uh, bot. They already, uh, then you already know the stuff that I'm going to tell you, but um, nevertheless, we have a huge uh, audience here, so we have to um, talk about this again. <coughs> so um, um, Stormworm uses uh, some components for its communication, and these are the both, um, the both yeah, components. It's the OverNet protocol they use, so it's mainly, it was used in eDonkey, and um, it uses the Kademlia DHT algorithm for routing in this, through this protocol, over this protocol. So, um, <coughs> yeah. Um, the, they, at first, they were using the OverNet infrastructure of eDonkey, so they, at first, just um, used the same protocol with no encryption as eDonkey did uh, use it, so they, had, uh, they could reuse the infrastructure of, of that and... Um, yeah, start with several or start with a few um, a few amount of nodes, um, yeah, and 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 um, they didn't have to have a huge network where routing is is perfect at the at the start. And then later, when they had enough nodes, they changed to use encryption, to the usage of encryption. So they separated their P2P network from the uh, from the eDonkey network, and this uh, was done by s simply using a static SOAR key that is in the binary, in each Stormworm binary. And uh, by this they encrypted, uh, they just sorted the packets and so normal eDonkey nodes would uh, not be able to recognize the packets that are coming and so they have a really separate network and you can ensure, you can be sure that if you get packets that are encrypted by this XOR key and you decrypt them and look at them and you see the, um, the bytes, yeah, we see this on the next slide, I think. No, not on the next slide, but... Um, yeah, then do, you can be sure that this is a storm node, really, that you are, get to, that you are getting packets from. So um, the second thing is um, the Kademlia DHT uh, algorithm. Um, just here's a slide for a short uh, overview over DHT. So D DHT is a distributed hash table um, where nodes and content uh, are identified by hashes. So it provides some means of um, routing and finding um, content or other nodes through searching for some specific hashes, and these hashes are, oh, we have this on the next slide, um, 
are of 128-bit length in the, this Kademlia DHT algorithm. 